Well, lovely to be here. Thank you all for lasting out a long day. And I'll try and um, sort of inject some <laughs> spontaneous ways of being able to justify my existence at the end of a day's proceedings where the conversation has gone much more away from my disciplinary expertise of iconographic studies in antiquity into their modern nation state debates and cultural patrimony and arguments around matters about cultural um, uh, propriety and hegemony and how cultural politics are to be played out. I don't think I'm completely alien from that neck of the woods. Um, I have of late been shouting a lot in the press, I think, about how we need to take matters of cultural politics a little bit more seriously than we have given it. Um, but before I begin, thank you very much, Renu, for inviting me, and thank you, Kavita, for putting together a conference on Gandhara. I think it's been years that I've been trying to call attention to the fact that Gandhara studies has been in an appalling condition in India. When I um, came back to, to um, India to work at JNU, it was one of my fundamental concerns to be able to um, start Gandhara studies once again. And we did something remarkable by being able to invite the curators of the Kabul Museum hot on the heels of their fantastic Afghanistan exhibition, which toured um, Italy and the United States and Britain and other places. Um, and give them some training and make them part of our classes at JNU, um, thanks to the collaboration of the University of Vienna. And that um, was an important moment because we could start actually building up libraries once again on Gandharan studies in India, which um, we haven't had our, our, our libraries on Gandhara developed since 1947. So when you read bibliographies and you see books that are available in uh, libraries in Calcutta University or in Delhi or in major institutions here, you'll be hard pressed to find the kind of up to date current research that is being done on the Northwest frontier being made available to students over here. And that is indeed, as Vazira pointed out, largely because the discipline has moved into a European sphere, a Euro American sphere. Um, I think. Um, what I want to focus on today is really, um, we all know that Gandhara is a unique part of the world which sees an extraordinary kind of an amalgamation of cultures. You encounter phenomenal statues like this one over here, probably a Zeus, uh, perhaps a Heracles, perhaps just a generic Hellenistic impression of a wise old man used for many icons. Um, it, if looked at from a Roman lens, you might say Poseidon or Jupiter, but in all likelihood to be uh, Zeus or, or uh, Heracles. Um, unfortunately, in museum displays, these things are often badly displayed at the wrong kind of angle. It's a part of one of those grand acrolithic images, even though it is actually stucco. But you can imagine a wooden armature covered image with this grand statue head right on top, um, looking down imperiously at an audience. It needs very much to be at a height rather than uh, the angle of vision is certainly not eye level at which it is normally displayed. Um, what really was it that was going on in the region of, of Gandhara? Um, what do we know about it? And how does, am I still audible if I'm here? Rather than that, because I can look at my slides and walk after me. Thank you. Um, what was it really that was going on there? Um, in the northern part of Afghanistan, there's a site called Ait Hanum, which was the capital of Bactria, and um, the region where uh, the earliest Indo Greek community lived. Extraordinary objects have been found from the gymnasium at Aikhanu, um, including that is a reconstruction of the sundial that was found there. And here is the fountain, which would have been on the western wall on the outside of the city, drawing in the water of the Oxus River, which would have come out of that spout. Spouts like these with the mask 
of a satyr or, a, a, or any kind of a, a humorous character is not unusual, it's not completely unheard of, and it's lovely to be able to find these examples from my Kanu. The sundials, however, that were found there, two that were found there, are extraordinary. And the reason is that the sundials aren't calibrated to the angle of the sun as they would be in northern Afghanistan. Instead, they are calibrated to the angle of the sun in the Aswan desert, right? So they are calibrated to Alexandria. Um, and that's very interesting because it shows that the city of Al-Khanum is importing objects for uh, telling the time as the time would have been somewhere else. And I think that's rather poetic and a very nice way for us to start our discussion on what's really going on. At whose time are we really examining the material objects of Gandhara? It's curious because at first glance you immediately say, oh yes, it's all an importation. They're foreigners who are coming to live in diaspora as they come to live in the land of Gandhara. Are they bringing with them some kind of a new culture ready to hybridize or mix with Indian culture? Or have they come with, are they developing their culture when they come into South Asia? You know, we need to understand what diasporas enable much better. A diasporic culture, you know, the, the Sikhs living in Canada, or the Hindus living, the Biharis living, former Biharis living in Mauritius, or living in Trinidad. Um, when you look at diasporic communities, you can't imagine them as being arrested, only being arrested in the time space that they, the time that they left the mother culture. You can't only judge them on the basis of the way in which the culture was, that they inherited it in the 1950s or 1920s or whenever it was that they left South Asia or whichever part they left. But they also continue to evolve um, and their, their culture, they keep lending to that culture and the culture grows in diaspora. And that is very much the case with the Greeks and the Hellenistic culture that lives in Bactria and in the Northwest Frontier. The biggest problem that has afflicted art historians is that we are always plagued by the desire to date things. And dating the Hellenistic style material and the Roman style material in Gandhara poses a lot of problems because it's Hellenistic, but not precisely. It has, the similar, it has a similar iconography to what is seen in, in, in Greece. It seems to be of an older style, yet it is innovative in its iconography. This lovely plaster cast of an emblema that was found in uh, room 13 in Bagram, uh, or Bagram as the news announces it nowadays, um, is uh, a phenomenal interpretation of the story of Eros and Psyche where Psyche is not seen in the normal way of being cast as a female, but has instead been turned into a fluttering butterfly that Eros captures, that faint thing that Eros will capture. And to have that, to have Psyche interpreted as a butterfly in this way has not been seen in Greek art, but it has been seen in the interpretation of the Greeks in diaspora. And that is something remarkable because you're seeing an evolution and a development of what is happening in the Greek way of thinking and Greek iconography in the Gandharan territories, which we had not imagined. So we've always tried to understand it only on the basis of how derivative it may be of Greek and Roman culture but not as a land that has agency in developing Greco-Roman iconography, which it does. So therefore, what do we mean that when I ask the question, which is the subject of my talk, what is the nature of Greek and Roman art in the Punjab and the Northwest Frontier Province? 
well, what do we mean by Greek and what do we mean by Roman? Who is Roman? You know, that's another question that we need to constantly keep in mind. Because the Roman Empire stretches from uh, Hadrian's Wall to Syria. And what, therefore, do you mean by Roman? And then what do you mean by, by when you say Greek? Wait, are you looking at the Hellenistic Empire at its height? And then looking at all the different ethnicities and cultures that might have come within that rubric. So we're looking at very large swathes of territory. Are these people just bringing in exotica with them? Fantastic vessels were found in Begram from the same room 13, made of porphyry. Porphyry is a stone that is found in Egypt, highly valued and prized at the time of um, the Romans, when it began to be used for making imperial sculpture. But um, imported also as a luxury item into the Northwest Frontier. Or oh, this pair of chargers, these fantastic silver dishes in the Al Sabah collection in Kuwait. The figure on the left is Dionysus, grapes in his hair. The figure on the right, a menad from the entourage of Dionysus. Two extraordinary pieces of silverware, two amongst dozens that are now in the Al Sabah collection. Uh, which have just been written up by the scholar Martha Carter in a book that's, I think, just hot off the press called Hellenistic Silverware. If anyone wants to read up something extraordinary from the region of Gandhara, that is the book to pick up, I think, at the moment. We don't know whether these were actually made in Gandhara or they were imported. But increasingly, if one did iconological studies to use iconological studies for ascertaining provenance, it would seem likely that they were probably made in Gandhara. And the reason for that is that it is not incidental that Euripides writes the Bacchae at about the same time when these objects are made. And what is Euripides' play on the Bacchae really about? The famous play by Euripides. It's about the plea that Dionysus makes to be able to re-enter Greece, to be able to go back to a homeland. As he goes back from the east, um, it's quite interesting to be able to think about that play within the social context of what is really happening in the second century BC when more and more Greeks are moving into diaspora all the way through to the first century AD. So what is this region that they are moving into diaspora? Where are they relocating? And what is this? What is the culture that they're going to bring with them? So as we zoom into, as everyone today has tried to do, into the heart of Asia and look at the lands that they inhabited, it is worth remembering what was the full extent of Alexander's empire. And what was the full extent of the Hellenistic kingdoms in the time of the Seleucids or Seleucids in Greek? The Seleucid kingdom actually spreads over much of Asia, where Greek turns into the major language of trade and exchange over this region. It enables things that the later Romans use profitably to their advantage in continuing with their trade in lands which are beyond Roman provinces. So if the Roman provinces ended on the borderlands of Turkey, Armenia, Syria, uh, the lands beyond it were already in long-standing trade arrangements in the Hellenistic times. And that enabled the movement of objects quite easily. Fantastic objects were brought into the Northwest frontier. The cameo that you see on the left Look at it carefully. He has a lion head, a hood that he wears. Clearly, it's Heracles. It was found in Bannu, or Accra, the mound at Bannu, in the Northwest Frontier Province. To its right is another Heracles, or perhaps a Serapis, also from background, um, made of bronze, dated to the first century AD, and preserved in the Kabul Museum now. Two other objects, 
another Hercules or Heracles at the left, um, recently brought out on display, but something that I originally photographed years back um, in the BM's collection, um, barely known, hardly published, um, wonderful bronze in the round. He's missing the club on which he would have been leaning. Um, a classic pose for a Heracles that was again found in the Northwest Frontier, but now in the British Museum. And beside it, a fantastic image of Harpocrates. Harpocrates, for those of you who don't know, is the son of Isis Hathor, the Egyptian mother goddess Isis, not what you guys think of as Isis from the newspapers these days. The original Isis, one that deserves your respect, please, not uh, the kind of ways in which you might want to think of Isis nowadays. Um, Harpocrates is the child of Isis, and um, shrines to Harpocrates, the child god, began to be made, and images of Harpocrates began to, be, began to spread all the way from London through to Kabul. In fact, even beyond Kabul to the Northwest Frontier. And this particular little bronze statuette is of the kind that would, people would have taken personally. They're portable objects. They went with people to different places. It's not just these portable objects that had a huge civilizational impact in transforming how people thought, but also coins, which are quite revealing. Amongst the relatively small range of deities most frequently represented on the coins, we find Zeus, Poseidon, Apollo, Heracles, the Dioscuri, Artemis, and Athena. The latter, that is um, 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 Athena, portrayed mostly in her typical Macedonian form as um, Athena Alcidemos, as well as Nike and Tike, personifications of victory and good fortune. Examples of cross influences with local divinities, however, are rare in the early period of the Indo Greek coins. For example, the crown of radiating spikes that surrounds the head of Artemis, perhaps suggesting the halo of light worn by the Iranian goddess Anahita, the Persian cup. Uh, the Persian, Persian cap worn by Zeus Mithra is also one that is surrounded by rays of light and is seen on other coins of Hermaeus, of Amintas, and lastly the wheel, which is an Indian symbol of universal kingship, is found on one lone copper coin of Menander. So how much Indian iconography are we seeing being assimilated with Greek iconography in the early period? Relatively little. There is a certain moment when there seems to be some cultural difference. After which, there is a concerted effort at a cultural mixing. Now, how will we term and at what ways will we, as post-colonial scholars, study cultural mixing? Are we going to study as hybridization, syncretization, a cultural creole, pigeon, mixing? What terms are we going to use for studying this cultural hybridity and mixing? Well, let me give you some examples of what we see. The symbol of Athena, for instance, the owl, is frequently seen on the coins, um, on, on a certain group of coins. Um, so too is the seated Athena. The coins that you can see of Agathocles um, have Zeus on them. These are all Indo-Greek kings, roughly, roughly speaking, for those of you who are not familiar, and my colleagues who are specialists, to please forgive me for this oversimplification, but roughly of the first century BC. There are coins, several coins, um, particularly of Euthydemus and Demetrius, that show Heracles on them. And you can see Heracles with a club, with, um, putting a diadem on his head, or you can see uh, Heracles leaning on his club. There are coins of Dionysus seen with the hairdo, which can have grapes in it, but most, most significantly with the obverse of the coin, with, or the reverse of the coin, with a, a panther on it, which is the cognizant or the vehicle of uh, Dionysus. Uh, Poseidon is rare 
we tend to see associate images of Poseidon more with Roman imagery than we do with Greek imagery. But here he is with um, a trident in his hand on the coin of Antimachus. Right? So just giving you a little thing, that when you see it on coins, you imagine these things are in circulation. And these are found, incidentally, from sites. Menander coins and others have been found in uh, sites like Mathura. Very commonly, they're found in Haryana, in around Ambala, that area. Then going up to Sialkot, and then extending through Ralpindi, etc., of course, all the way through into Afghanistan, where you find a large number. So that's the catchment area that we are looking at where these Indo-Greek coins circulate. <coughs> now, imagery on coins is something really significant because that, is, that shows us that this, these are images that are circulating amongst a wider range of people. This is not an art historical exercise where we are looking at one object which is a precious object in a monastery or something which is available to people who believe in a particular religion, but this is something that is being disseminated. So therefore, coming back to our fundamental question, which is the question for today's talk, what is the nature of Greek and Roman art in the Punjab and Northwest Frontier Province? And how do they mix with Indian art? You see, we've got all these labels, Greek, Roman, Indian. So unless we unpack what we mean, who we want to own as being Indian, as Vazira just said, we're not going to be able to answer this question, are we? I mean, is Indian, is somebody who lives in Herat Indian uh, or, or not? I mean, that's, and, and you know, sans the kind of political baggage of Akhand Bharat that might be associated with this, we need to be able to think about this as a larger civilizational question. What are we talking about over here? Now, the case studies that I could have elaborated on, and I've listed eight, I think, which are the most prominent case studies that art historians normally talk about. Vajrapani, the Bodhisattva, is very often cast like the Greek Hercules, or sorry, Greek Heracles, Roman Hercules, <laughs> who is also cast as Behram, the Zoroastrian deity. So it's very interesting that Heracles is converted, is used as a model by in Iran for making images of Behram, and he is used as a model in the Indian context for making images of Heracles, of Vajrapani, sorry. Similarly, am I going to talk to you about Shiva, the Hindu god who is often associated with intoxicants and inebriants, who is seen ethyphallic, who is seen, who is known for his priapic nature. Am I going to associate him with Dionysus, with whom he finds parallels, or with an older Yaksha cult, with which, again, it has parallels, or with a deity that we seem to know very little about called Vaishya, who is seen on Zoroastrian coins, who is mentioned on Zoroastrian coins, but has all the iconography of Shiva. Shall we collate, conflate Helios with Surya? These are relatively easy ones. It becomes trickier when we come to the ladies. Because Lakshmi is associated with the Iranian Ardoksho and Anahita, who are both associated with TK and Fortuna. TK in the Hellenistic world, Fortuna in the Roman world. Goddesses of prosperity and good fortune who carry in their hands cornucopias or are seen with lotuses around them associated with the divine waters which they are supposed to fertilize and are supposed to fertilize the earth with that. Or shall we look at protective goddesses, goddesses who might be associated as city goddesses. Kibele, for instance, is a good one. Or Nanaya, frequently also called Nana in, in Central Asia. Nana is the goddess who is seen on the lion, riding a lion. And that is very similar to a protective goddess associated with the city. Her name, in fact, means fortification, Durga. 
Durga, she of the city, she who protects the fortification, Durga, right? And from that, you take the idea that she too rides a lion. So the, 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 the mixing of Kibele, Nanaya, and Durga, again, not unreasonable. Then we come to the case of Isis, a magna mater, rather like a matrika that we have in Matra. They all sit on stools, on chairs, with children around them. Demeter sits in much the same way, like the Buddhist Hariti, or like the Shaivite Uma. And then we have other scenes, and I'm just mentioning one, a standard dining room mosaic scene, the rape of Ganymede. No, the rape of Ganymede, honestly, used to be put frequently in Roman villas as a mosaic scene in their dining rooms. It was a frequently found Roman mosaic, early Roman mosaic. And the rape of Ganymede usually shows an eagle-like bird carrying a woman away, which is rather similar to the story of King Kakati being carried away by uh, the Naga. Um, and and uh, so by the Garuda, sorry. <laughs> or you have a Garuda and Naga story in Buddhist legend. So they're very similar legends. They have very similar iconographies. And the, the, the images are self, there's so many parallels that there is no doubt when you start seeing the images that the images are consciously polyvalent. So that different people who would see that image would immediately recognize it as being of their cultural language, of their cultural language. So what looks like a yaksha to me might be Shiva to you, might be Vesho to somebody else, and might be Dionysus to the fifth person. And that's the interesting job that art historians are confronted with now, which is the plausibility of the fact that they can simultaneously be Zoroastrian, Hindu, Buddhist, Egyptian Ptolemaic, Hellenistic or Latinized Roman. And that simultaneity is what I'm going to talk about in today's talk. So I'm going to try and take you beyond the binary of Hellenism and Buddhism, which usually plagues all studies on Gambharan art because it's always called, since the days of Alfred Fouché, it's been called the Greco-Buddhist art. And I think that label has done us well so far, but it excludes several other constitu constitutive elements. And those constitutive elements perhaps need to be given some attention. So I'd like to debunk that Greco-Buddhist term. <coughs> and while well, there's no gainsaying about the importance India's trading links had with Rome, Art historically, we are becoming increasingly aware of the need, and we are sometimes even becoming capable of telling the difference between the interaction between India, India's Gandharan interactions with Rome or with Ptolemaic Egypt versus the Deccan's interaction, as I was discussing, for those of you who were here last year in the Aesthetics Project Conference, with the Deccan's interaction with the same region. Just as the word Indian as a category may be so diverse as to mean nothing, so too, no doubt, was Roman. Yet, this is not an essentialization that we are culpable of today. Even in antiquity, the word Yavana seems to have been used indiscriminately for a Western foreigner, be he Greek, Egyptian, Roman, or any other. Thus, whereas there may have been wisdom at one level, at one level when people like Alfred Fouché and Grunwedel, who was invoked by Vazira just now, and others who wrote in the late 19th and early 20th century coined phrases like Greco-Buddhist. Careful unpacking can, in some rare cases, like the sculptures I'm going to show you, demonstrate how identities have not been essentialized into some kind of a mishmash. You know, some hodgepodge khichri that we think Gandhara is. Gandhara can sometimes very carefully preserve difference. And that's what I want to focus on. Gandhara was never part of the Roman Empire, yet it was an important thriving part of the world that was obviously in direct contact with Rome and its provinces. Its hybrid iconographies and art styles have enthralled scholars for nearly two centuries now. 
and one should not find this hybridity remarkable anymore. You know, I mean, it would be pretty silly of us to come together at a conference to say, oh, what a remarkable world Gandhara was. I mean, for 200 years we've been saying that, right? So let's actually move beyond that statement and try and actually unpack the different constitutive elements that made up Gandhara. This group of sculptures communicates not by conflating, realizing, or making syncretic the iconographic conventions of different peoples, but rather by maintaining and bringing together a mosaic of distinct identities to perform their role. What does this say about the nature of the audience? What does it say about the people, the kind of transculturalism or multiculturalism that was around in Gandhara at the peak of what we normally call the peak of the Roman Empire, the second to third centuries AD. Rather than associating these objects as the products of a marginalized community at the extremities of some post-colonial creole, these varied iconographies bespeak a society that aims to maintain cultural distinctiveness and identities of its very varied audiences, rather than hybridizing it all in a globalized transcultural world. Let's remind ourselves of the kind of objects that are coming out of Gandhara. So what I'm going to do first is examine, I'm not going to be able to go through all my case studies, all seven things that I know, eight things that I listed there, but I'll go through a few of them. So let's look at Shiva. Now, the previous slide shows you how popular the cult of, how the cult of Dionysus was being inherited in the Northwest frontier. Um, these line drawings have been prepared by the numismatist Joe Craig, of formerly of the British Museum. And um, they are line drawings derived from Kushan period coins. He tells you which monarch, Kuvishka, Chashtan, Vima Katfaisis, etc. And then um, the kind of symbol that is seen on the coin of that king and the kind of iconographic attributes that that person is seen with. Now I've circled the ones which are most Shaivite, just to be able to make a case for leading to a more Shaivite attribution. Some are seen with a consort, Shiva with Uma type. However, some, the consort seems to be not Uma, but perhaps a Nana figure. Sometimes we can see that they're clearly with a trident, sometimes with a bull, sometimes the figure is ethyphallic. But most often they are inscribed Weisho, who is, like I said, an, Iran an Iranian deity. Sometimes we find seals too, where we find a mithun couple, and in the light of the sexual symbolism and the coupling that is associated with Shiva and Uma, it might be that it is referring to uh, the coupling that is associated with Indian deities. There are others as we move on from the Indo-Greek through the Kushan period when we come to statuary. So we were looking at Sahri Bahalol a little while ago as a site that several people have referred to today. This one, this is a clear image of Shiva with an erect phallus, a trident in his hand, but curiously also a chakra, which we normally associate with Vishnu. Or the Berlin Museum's famous, famous multi-headed example of Shiva, one of the first examples of a multiple-headed deity in Indian art. <coughs> Oh, sorry, that was Stuttgart. This one's Berlin. <laughs> Both in German collections. Again, ethyphallic. Again, with a trident. A third eye represented more horizontally rather than vertically, which is something that happens in some of the earliest figures. Or this example, which is in the Peshawar Museum, um, again, with multiple heads,
It's a phallic leaning on a bull. And so in time, we go, as we see the iconography of Shiva develop. Not static. Shiva was never all the things that we associate with Shiva now. But these are some of the earliest images of Shiva that have been found in South Asia that we have just gone through. And we have rapidly gone through the evolution of Shaivite imagery till we reach this glorious example, again from, from Bannu in the Northwest Frontier, that shows um, a wonderful image of an Ekamukhalinga, perhaps dated to a late Gupta or, an, or to a Gupta period date. This can be associated alongside another group of images which have puzzled art historians for a long time, where we find a figure, a female figure, carrying a wine cup in her hand with a trident, and one who possesses a pair of fangs. She's an ogress. Is she a protokali? Is she a Shaivite deity? Or is she derived from the world of Hariti and the other Matrikas? We don't know, but I will come in a little while to other examples of Matrikas that might have existed in early India in the same region. Certainly, the idea of a woman with a trident is not unknown even in the realm of iconography in Mathura. And that's earlier than the one which we associate uh, from Gandhara. So what I've tried to do in this brief summary of slides is go through Shiva's evolution through and beyond the Kushan period. <coughs> Many images of Vesho on Kushan coins appear to be of Shiva. There is a famous inscription that has been much talked about over the past 15 years called the Rabatak inscription, which refers to Umma, who may be Umma. Skanda, or Kartik, or Subramanyam, or Murugan, or whatever you want to call him, normally is somebody we think of as the son of Shiva, is widespread in the region and associated with Hariti and the other Matrikas. Although it is unlikely that he was already associated as the son of Shiva by this date, yet it is likely that what we are looking at when we look at images of Skanda in Gandhara, it is likely that this is the very region and time when that association of Skanda with Shiva is being fostered. Because both deities are being given a lot of importance in Gandhara art. One sculpture of Hariti, which I've just shown you, has been shown with fangs and a trident, suggesting a possible connection with Shaivism. Later, by the fifth century, several other Hindu images are also seen. Now, I'm not going to detail a lot of them, but I'm just going to give you some confusing images. <clears throat> a figure riding a quadriga with two attendants. <coughs> is it Surya? Or is it Helios? Or is it Mitra? You see, you could easily associate it with being Mitra as well. Or do you want to call it Aditya or Mihir or Agni? Or where do you want to go? How far do you want to go with the iconographic confusions that persist? Perhaps the most glorious one, of course, is the case of Vajrapani. Now, for all intents and purposes, when people normally used to see this, art historians would always say, oh yeah, Trevi Fountain. Few people would have really imagined that it was actually a first century AD, perhaps, image from Gandhara. This image used to be used to flank a Buddha statue. On the other side, flanking the Buddha on the other side was a Hariti. Um, there were three grottos together at uh, Tepe Shotor, um, which is near Jalalabad. For those of you who don't know your geography, um, Jalalabad is just across the Khyber when you enter Afghanistan. And um, uh, this was a remarkable shrine. Um, the shrine doesn't exist anymore. Um, at the School of Art and Aesthetics, and sort of around the time when I was wanting very much to draw more attention to Gandhara, and we put it on the cover of our school handbook, and I think that's the best resolution picture I still have of, 
of the of the sculpture. The sculpture has been bombed. Um, I, but for me, it's a greater casualty than the loss of the Bamiyan Buddha personally. I think there was a lot more art history that was embedded in, in that particular image. Now, let's look at the image. He's next to Buddha, yet he's Hercules with a lion skin draped on his shoulder. He's clearly a classical god. Yet, if you look at him more, you'll see that in his other hand, he holds a Vajra. Vajras are normally shaped like thigh bones, and they can have these bulbous ends, terminus, on uh, either end of it. And he is, of course, the Buddhist Vajrapani. But for a non-Buddhist who is visiting from Western Asia or from the Near East or from the Hellenistic world, he is immediately Heracles. Other dramatic and glorious statues have been found. They've been secreted away in private collections. Some things have come up for sale. One of them is this remarkable statue, again, of Heracles made of terracotta. Now, this kind of mixing of being able to communicate two things simultaneously is not peculiar to the Vajrapani Heracles conflation. We see it with TK, as I mentioned. We see it with Ardoksho. We see it with Lakshmi and the Matrikas. So, for instance, this impression of a ceiling which shows a goddess with cornucopias in her hand. The cornucopia would associate her with Fortuna or TK or one of the Hellenistic goddesses of plenty. And yet you see she has two elephants on either side of her who flank her, pouring water on her like Gachalakshmi. And so there is this very deliberate coming together of different deities. Or in this very famous Kabul Museum spectacular piece of a silver plate with the representation of Kibele. Um, again, Kibele, because of the crown that she wears, which is like a fortified um, city, that she wears a fortified um, crown, but a Nike in front of her, but she rides a chariot which is pulled by lions, which is not normally associated with Kibele, but is associated more with Nanaya or, Na or Nana. And that makes us think that is she Kibele or is she Nana? Celestial gods, the sun, moon, and stars, all there to witness this fact as she proceeds towards the temple on a land of gold. So much information about the city goddess and the land of gold that she is the city goddess of. And as she moves forward, but she rides a, a chariot pulled by lions. And then, of course, that is exactly what Durga does, um, rides lions. Or when we look at the famous Panchika and Harati that come allegedly from Taktebahi. Now, Taktebahi, which we've had a whole talk on this morning. Um, who is, we see Harati seated here. Harati is a Buddhist goddess, but with a cornucopia in her hand, um, with a consort, a hand strategically on his thigh, which is exactly how we're going to see Shiva and Parvati for years to come in Indian iconography. Um, many images have been found of Hariti with her consort. Is the consort to be associated with the Iranian deity Pharaoh, or is, it to be is he to be associated with the Buddhist Panchika? Is he to be associated with the Hindu and Buddhist Kobera? This idea of showing coupled deities is something that Alfred Fouché wrote a lot about. And he said that tutelary deities like this are quite common all the way from Gaul to India. And he looks at examples in terracotta from Gaul to India, which he keeps citing as examples to show that this is a shared way in which images were being conceived. Now, this is a very decisive moment in the history of world art. You see, the origins of Indian iconography have got trapped in a big debate about whether Indians came up with these images first or whether Indian imagery comes to India from the Greco-Roman world. And it got caught up with a lot of nationalistic debates. 
The same is true if you go to France or if you go and look at the shift from Celtic imagery into Roman imagery that is taking place in Britain. So when you look at images of deities like Rose Myrta, um, a Celtic goddess, and, or how she is strategically and conveniently married off to Mercury, and that starts taking place in the British Isles, it's in the same way that Hariti might be getting married off over here. To, and the model is, is something that we know of. I mean, Meenakshi famously marries Shiva um, in South India. So the model of marrying a deity from one culture to a deity of another culture is not something that is unusual to iconographers at this time in time, at this moment in time. It is happening widely across the world at this time. Here, Hariti is seen more conventionally, with lots of children all around her. A fantastic sculpture in the Peshawar Museum, seen with her consort, Panchika. Now, who is Hariti? Well, what do we know about Hariti? Buddhist legend tells us about an ogress who used to devour children. And even though she had a hundred children of her own, she would go around consuming other people's children. In order to propitiate her, people would bring, make an offering of children at her temple, at her shrine. So an annual festival would demand child sacrifice at her shrine in order to keep her placated. Professor Beaver, David Beaver, wrote an article about the fact that images of Hariti become very popular in the second century AD, coincidentally at a time when there is a major epidemic of smallpox or some other related anthrax epidemic that sweeps over much of Asia, decimating the Roman army, but having a major impact uh, across Asia. It's not unusual to have goddesses made to propitiate, to keep, to allay illnesses. All over India, even now, the name that is associated with chickenpox is Mata, or Devi, or Mariamman, or Sitala, or some such goddess who is associated with causing, the mother who causes and can therefore remove the pox. Perhaps Hariti's way of claiming children in ancient times, he speculates, was also by causing epidemics of smallpox. And the only way to placate her was by sacrificing a child at her shrine. The fact that these stories are mentioned in Buddhist legend is quite interesting because she's not a particularly Buddhist goddess. But she is incorporated into Buddhism. She is from some pre-existing pantheon of deities who is brought into Buddhism in about the first century. Why is she brought into Buddhism? Because several, this was an old standing model, many old yakshas and yakshinis who could not be ignored. If your child falls sick, you're not going to exactly sit down and pray and imagine that the wisdom of the Bodhisattva is going to cure your child, but you're told that there is a ogress whose temple exists in the sh somewhere in the city. And if you go and pray there, she is the one who causes smallpox and she will remove smallpox from your child. You will go and pray there. And in that time of desperation, because she is associated with, the, uh, 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 with such ferocity, she can't be ignored by early Buddhists and therefore she's incorporated into early Buddhist temples. Now frequently, Kubera and Hariti are placed at the entrance to monasteries. <clears throat> and monasteries is what we've been hearing a lot about from Kurt Berendt today in the region of Taktebahi, or well, monastic establishments <laughs> around there. This particular Hariti has an inscription on it, um, and it's the one in the Chandigarh Museum that came originally from the collection of the Lahore Museum. <coughs> Um, Haritis are quite common. They're found in the Amaravati style. This one is in the Guntur Museum in the Deccan. 
Um, they are found in uh, the region of uh, uh, Mathura. Um, so, so they are found widely all over the subcontinent. The word Hareti, Jo Harleti, the one who steals. Um, so she is mostly associated as being this fetus stealer. <clears throat> and note, of course, the fact that she is seen with a baby in her lap seated like a magna mater on a stool. Now, similarly, uh, we have examples of her, like I said, from Mathura. This is in the reserve collection of the Mathura Museum, and again, surrounded by lots of children, with, again, with her baby in her lap. Now, according to Buddhist legend, in order to teach her a lesson, the Buddha hid her youngest baby, Pingala, or sometimes called Priyankara, the beloved, under his begging bowl. And Harithi was so distraught that she went everywhere looking for her baby, and she couldn't find it, and she finally came to the Buddha for help. The Buddha used it as an opportunity to teach her a lesson, and said if this is the anguish that she feels of the loss of just one of her hundred children, imagine the anguish that she has caused all the other mothers of the world, Hariti then became a convert to Buddhism and said that she, if she is worshipped at Buddhist shrines in a peaceful way, she will forever be a protectress of children rather than an ogress who consumes children. And so images of Hariti began to be placed. But the type that we see, if we are iconographers and art historians, is a very common type. We've seen them in Tanagra terracottas of the nursing mother, right, where we frequently see images of <coughs> the old woman seated with a baby in her lap. And like that, we see it in Roman iconography, in Greek iconography, so the type is endemic across the old world. This particular statue is of interest to me because she holds a bunch of grapes. The little baby pulls at a necklace. Um, that's the same image in, in color, just photographed from a different angle, so you can perhaps see it better here. Her feet rest on a footstool, but the statue I want to talk to you about most is this one in the collection of the British Museum. On careful exam, this particular sculpture is supposed to have come from Yusuf Zai, which we were just hearing about from Bazira, same region as Takhtevahi, from a monastic establishment, from the entrance to one of the monasteries there, given by a Colonel Walker to the British Museum in um, 1886 is when it is accessioned. It's a gracious statue. It has two sockets on either side, probably to hold a halo or something around it. It's in very shallow relief. It's not deep at all. Um, it has all the usual things, a, a, a wreath-shaped headdress, a benevolent gesture, uh, Priyankara or Pingala tugging on the necklace, Note the date of these images. These are earlier than Madonna and Child images that we find. But it is very interesting to see how the type becomes endemic. Like I said, it's there in Greco-Roman art, it's there in Indian art, it's a particular type that gets used in world iconography. It keeps getting reabsorbed. Now, it has all the usual things that we associate um, with Hellenistic and Gandharan imagery. So I'm not going to get into too much detail about that. What I'm particularly interested in are the children that you see around her. You know, the statue has been published so many times, but nobody has really cared to look at these babies carefully. And when you really look at the children, you can actually recognize each one of the children. So sitting on one side, the baby with the finger raised to his mouth is the standard gesture of the son of Isis called Harpocrates. He's the Egyptian child god. And what's wonderful about this one is that he even wears a mohawk. If you look at his hairstyle, he's got this central band of hair, while the rest of his head has been shaved in a hairstyle which is clearly not associated with Indian images, but is widely seen as an Egyptian hairstyle at this time. So it's quite nice to see this Egyptian baby. And we found, like I said, other examples of Harpocrates and Gandhara. So it's not unusual. He's not the only Harpocrates. I showed you one from the Kabul Museum. This is one in the Karachi Museum. This one was found in Takshila, 
and um, the other one was found in Begram. The, and the Hariti is, or the statue is from Yusuf Zai. When you look below Harpocrates at these two children, they are of course the famous wrestling twins. And we have so many examples of the wrestling twins in Gandhar. <coughs> People think it might be exploits of the baby Siddharth um, in the Jataka scenes when he is shown as a wrestler. But it is more likely to be a reference to the twins, the Dioscuri. Now the Dioscuri is the Hellenistic name, the Greek name, for the deities that we know as Gemini in Latin, the constellation of Gemini. And of course, these are in Indo-European myth related to the idea of the Vedic Nasatya or the Vedic Ashwin twins, which are again have the same pedigree and evolution as the idea of the twins that get absorbed into different iconographic systems in the world. And that's exactly what we see here. But what's interesting is the Dioscuri are often associated with physical strength. They are worshipped as charioteers, and here we see it put on a wrestler's weight. There are other examples of the Dioscuri, um, very commonly found on the coins of Eucratides, where you see them as twins riding horses. Like I said, they're also associated with, charioteer, with charioteering, and that's how you see them here. Or you see them as wrestlers, again, on a weight, which very interestingly, the weight itself has is double-sided. This one is in the Rusek collection in Switzerland and has on one side Krishna fighting the demon Keshin, the baby Krishna, again, a sign of strength, and the baby Diaspora, a sign of strength. What an appropriate thing to put on a wrestler's weight in an akhara where uh, they could show the idea of physical strength amongst young boys. This famous piece in the Metropolitan Museum again shows the wrestlers on the one side and Hercules on the other, again appropriate imagery for um, a wrestler's weight in, once again, in a gymnasium. So, I think the best example I can't show you images of, but Chiro no Museo has published the uh, famous temple of um, the Dioscuri at Delbergin um, in Central Asia. And the Delbergin temple has had paintings which showed the goddess associated with the Dioscuri, so which is what we have, the goddess being associated with the Dioscuri. Now, there is a baby who sits between Hariti's legs. Who might this baby be? I was at pains to try and figure out who this figure might be, and I couldn't really come up with a conclusive answer, till uh, one of my colleagues, Marianne Bergman, um, helped me out. And she attracted me to the excavations in Sidon that had been done by Rolf Stuckey. Stuckey's work, shows that there are hundreds and hundreds of these so-called Cypriot temple boys that were made widely in, the Lebanon, in Lebanon and in Cyprus that were always placed directly in front of the temple to Isis. And they had a distinct pose, one leg folded, one leg bent up, and one arm pointing the way as if to the shrine of Isis. And they would be put up as, as uh, ex voto reliefs that pilgrims would bring with them for blessings for their male children. And with one or two that are in a similar sort of pose was one thing. And then, of course, the Metropolitan Museum revealed that it had a couple of hundred and, and from the says Louis de Cesnola collection. And then the British Museum revealed it had another couple of hundred. And, uh, and then when we go into the reserves of the stores of the museums in Lebanon um, and in Cyprus, we find many, many more. And it becomes a standard type of votive relief that people would have put in front of the temple directly as an offering shrine in front of the temple to the Magna Mata. So um, there we see how the storerooms are filled with these temple boys. 
always in the same pose, and always directly in front of Isis, exactly how it has been positioned in our sculpture, in the middle of her legs, pointing the way to her. Now we come to the other three children on the other side of her. This child, it turned out, is of course none other than Skanda Kartikeya. Um, he has a baby in his, uh, a bird on his wrist. And if you look at him aerially, his hair is arranged into three ponytails, which is exactly how Kartikeya's hair is meant to be in early iconographic texts. So that became quite clear that, you know, you've got Skanda Kartikeya on one side, Harpocrates on the other side. This much was easy. This, getting this far, it's taken me years, and I have to acknowledge the enormous cooperation and help I've received from my colleagues in the Getty Foundation who have really facilitated a lot of this research, as well as the British Museum where the sculpture is housed. Now, looking below that figure, at the two characters below, these two figures. I'd like you to look at, well, before I come to that, I'll quickly show you that Kartikeya is not unusual in Gandhara. We find them in Mathura statues, in little bronze statues found in the Northwest frontier, find it in several Gandhara, I'm sorry, that's proportions of that image have gone all right. Um, find it in gracious sculptures where he is shown as Mahasena, one of his other names that is associated with Kartikeya as the leader of the army. Um, but anyway, I'm going to come to the last set of figures, who I think are the Zoroastrian twins, Amurdad and Hordad, or Horvatad. Who are all the other children that we've seen around Hariti? You've seen somebody who is Phoenician, the temple boy. You've seen somebody who is Egyptian, Harpocrates. You've seen somebody who is Hellenistic, the Dioscuri. You've seen somebody who is Hindu, Skanda Kartikeya. You've covered all the major religions of the ancient world, which is the missing one, of course, Iran, the Zoroastrian one. That's the missing part. But the odd thing is, we know remarkably little about early Zoroastrian imagery. Early Zoroastrian imagery is known to be an iconic rather like Vedic imagery, it worshipped the sacred fire. There were no images that were really made. So ascertaining what might be a Zoroastrian image from ancient times is fraught with controversy and problems. So where does one go? And how, does one, how did those people who wanted to image Zoroastrians start their job? Now, Zoroastrians are confronted with much the same problems as the Hindus and the Buddhists are at this time because a lot of images for deities are being made all over the world for the first time, at this moment in time. And how are Zoroastrians going to figure out how they're going to make their images? And who are they going to choose to image? On this sculpture, opposite the Dioscorai, by Hariti's right foot, are a set of twins with distinctive off-shoulder long tunics it is likely that they too are a pair. Neither the costume nor the bowl and cup which they hold, however, can specifically be associated with any known images. Now since all the other four major religions of the world and communities of the world have been depicted here, it is likely that one should explore Zoroastrian imagery. Several inscriptions of the Kushans in Afghanistan and in the Gandhara heartland, both on coins as well as on stone, mention the names of many ancient Zoroastrian deities. There is little doubt that Zoroastrianism was one of the major religions that was recognized by the Kushan state. However, identifying any, iconogra any iconography definitively with pre-Sasanian or Parthian Zoroastrianism without, inscri without inscriptions to substantiate them remains difficult. One may speculate, however, that this pair represents Amardad and Hordad, who are connected with the life-sustaining plants, food, and fertilizing water and drink. So note the fact that they hold a bowl and a cup in their hands. 
What's interesting also is that one of them wears a hair ornament, which is like a tikka that falls on the top of the forehead, <laughs> attached to their hair. Their distinctive curls and this very particular, almost like a kiton, but a kiton without a brooch, um, a girl's dress. It's not a boy's dress. Is this a pair of girls rather than a pair of boys? Is what I would like to speculate. Amurdad and Hordad are two of the principal Anshaspantas that are respectively symbolic of immortality and of good health and wholeness. These figures in the British Museum Hariti are shown with a bowl and a cup. These are often symbols of food, plenty, and immortality, all of which would be in keeping with the nature of these Zoroastrian deities. They are associated with the, the Amardad and Horda are associated with the stories of the birth of Zarathustra himself and are known to strengthen sacrificial offerings and are associated with divine food. The Avestan, Amartat, and Horbatat are seen originally as female, and for the most part, they continue to be thought of as female, except when in Middle Persian, they lose their grammatical gender and are rendered as male figures. So only for a brief while in their history do they become male, but otherwise they were originally thought of as female. Considering that the identities of the rest of the figures on this culture include every other major cult of the Hellenistic and Roman period, it would be unlikely for Zoroastrianism to not be represented on this culture. So coming towards my conclusion now. What we have seen on this culture is a Hariti who embodies a paradoxical principle of a demonic ogress and a nurturing mother, a duality. As an ogress, she symbolized the destructive powers, devouring children and ravaging the land, but converted by the Buddha, she became a protective force, ensuring fertility, providing pros prosperity. Likewise, a duality is also seen in Panchika, the consort of Hariti, who can be as much a powerful protector <coughs> as much as he can be a beneficent giver. The dualism that we see is inherent in the children surrounding Hariti as well. Again, binaries everywhere. Look at the stories of these children. Who are these children? They all symbolize duality that is needed for birth, because no birth can take place without duality. Of the twin Dioscuri, Castor is the mortal son of the Spartan king Tyndareus, and Pollux is the immortal son of Zeus. Harpocrates, or Horus, was born of the scattered bits of Osiris' seed. Skanda, Kartikeya, was born of Shiva's seed, but was claimed variously by his wife Parvati, by Agni, by the wives of the six stars known as the Kritikas, who nursed him. The child in Hariti's own lap, Priyankara, the beloved one, was the one who was stolen, and then he was the one who was restored. And if the second set of twins really are the girls, Amardad and Hordad, then they too would symbolize a dialectic of the world of mortals and the world of Ahura Mazda by embodying the energies that transform the spiritual into the material. I think there is a lot to be said for these kinds of images. What we've seen is a sculpture that preserves difference. I think <coughs> what we've looked at is an image where identities of the different communities have not been collapsed into some stylistic mishmash that we notice with Hariti. But what is clear is that the identities of each of the deities around Hariti has been kept distinct. So different people who would have encountered this image would have each of them have read their deity. So the visiting Egyptian would have seen Hippocrates. The visiting Hindu would have seen Kartikeya. The visiting Zoroastrians might have recognized Amardad and Hordad, the Greeks, the Diasporae, the Lebanese, the temple boy. All of this is present around a figure who sits in a pose that is a generic pose. The pose is of a generic goddess of a Demeter, or an Isis, or a Matrika, or a Harit. What's happened is that there has been a conflation in the main figure 
but there has been distinctiveness in the surrounding figures. So two things are happening simultaneously. A collapsing of difference, homogenization, but also the separation of difference and the maintenance of identities. Right? Both things are taking place. And I think that's what we need to be aware of when we think of multiculturalism. Images of Gandharan mixing are not uncommon from the 2nd to the 4th centuries. Like I said earlier, it isn't unusual for a scholar to make a statement about the curiously hybrid nature of the art of Gandhara. Yet what I've tried to do in this paper is unpack those differences. Now, locating regional identities in an age of transcultural networks in the aftermath of great empires is very problematic. This is what all of us as post-colonial scholars are aware of. You see, Greek has become the lingua franca across Asia, rather like English becomes the lingua franca in, post -colonial, in the post-colonial world. However, Greece itself at this time has come under Latin influence. Remember, Greece has been captured by Rome in the period that we are examining. And the major language that has been used in Greece at this time for statecraft and for writing is Latin and not Greek. So where is Greek living at this time? Where is the Greek culture alive at this time? Nowhere except in diaspora, right? The Parthians declare themselves as <coughs> Philhellenic, meaning friends of the Greeks. And they have no small impact on the immediately pre-Kushan and Kushan art. Meanwhile, back in India, all foreigners are conveniently called Yavanas. Homogenization is taking place. Difference is not being respected in the terminology. So what I am trying to get at is with the little objects that we are looking at, we see symbols and objects that can be used in person-to-person -person contact in transcultural networks. We see in an age of diaspora, we can see here how a single image communicates to diverse people. The times we live in, attendant to globalization, is a fear of homogenizing difference. And yet, what it has enabled oftentimes is a cosmopolitanism that allows for different local practices to coexist, even as some differences collapsed. In my talk, I've tried to examine some of these issues through a close reading of a remarkable ancient Buddhist sculpture of Hariti that comes from the vicinity of Peshar in ancient Gandhara. Gandhara, as we all have seen today, absorbed a variety of people and traditions, Central Asian, Indian, Iranian, Greek, West Asian, and as this talk has shown, even Egyptian. Looked at from the diversity of the children all around her, she may not have been the Buddhist Hariti to them. While the Greeks could think of her as Demeter, the Egyptians probably regarded her as Isis, and the Hindus as Uma or a Matrika. In such cases, images is emerged as polyvalent, sometimes syncretic. However, in this example, as we can see, they also show an awareness of difference. Thank you all very much. the link between um, the similarity with the Virgin and Child, but it is more than just a similarity because um, the Virgin and Child enters Christian art by Coptic art, where it comes from Horus Nisus, yes. um, and it transfers to the West with the, in the Book of Kells, the Virgo Lactans, the very first image of the Virgin uh, feeding the baby, comes directly from Coptic art, come, borrowed directly from I said, Horace, it works. It full circle, it goes in both directions. Yeah. Heads, off, heads off to Christians, heads off to Afghanistan. Exactly. Wonderful. Okay. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's yeah. I mean, there is much that one could have elaborated on and gone into the details of the ancient history of different cultures. But I think uh, we do need to take a step back to look at these shared histories that lie at the base of some of these images. 
questions, I can see several. <laughs> How do you want to do that? Do it yourself. Oh, no, 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 I was fascinated by your insightful reflection and Matthew's analysis and, uh, uh, because I've been exploring a similar problem in Buddhist iconography. I was really intrigued by your talks and uh, you have brought a very compelling example at the last moment. I'd just like to ask, uh, just to clarify your point, I'd like to ask a few questions. First, I'd like to, I wonder, the, when uh, an individual identity is important, or when exclusive identity is important. Now, it's not automatically important in every case. Just uh, it is some, you know, very yes. often it, it doesn't make good uh, 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 matters. So <laughs> that's uh, my question. And also at the same time, your grand question of uh, what is Greek or Roman, and the. Uh, that question of kind of designation of, of a source as an identity and also iconographical identity could be considered separate problems, although they, are, they may be related. And also, uh, you brought a really compelling example. I was completely convinced by your uh, meticulous analysis of the British Museum Haridi and it's a, uh, it's really fascinating, that, uh, but uh, I kind of have an impression that's a very special piece, and uh, it's, it's almost like a metaphysical, you know, the, the symbolism. Uh, it's, it's deliberately shown something like that, and I'm wondering about in terms of functions. I mean, the, who could, you know, the, you know, the. the, the uh, have uh, that such things made, and uh, so you know that there could be yes. uh, you, it's very it. hard to find in you know, those examples yes. like I, this. I so, so you know, just uh, coalesce uh, or conflate juxtapose whatever. Uh, all such things cannot be considered at the same level. So, and uh, lastly, I I mean because I'm really uh, like your paper, I think. There's also a dimension of 20th century. I mean that the, there have been many strange things coming out in the second part of the 20th century. And uh, I think when something is somewhat unfamiliar, strange, I think it's a responsibility of those who present those pieces. Yes. We have right to question such pieces. So I would. Uh, I mean, because you have uh, many other good pieces, you don't have to probably have to use such pieces because you could open to some questions. It, it's a minor one, but, but... Absolutely. Thank you. I think both are very relevant questions. Your second question I'll take first, and then your more fundamental question I'll take next. Um, your second question about the fact that you're absolutely right. I could have made my point completely without showing some of the recent discoveries which I included in my talk. I did it deliberately as a provocateur. I want people to start looking at these new discoveries. I think uh, we have been too judgmental and because I can make my case and prove my case with older images that were known in the 19th century and very early 20th century, um, the reason for including the recent discoveries of the past 20 years is also to be able to draw attention to the world about what kind of damages have been wreaked um, upon the Northwest frontier. And I think what's gone on in Afghanistan, um, I tried to make my talk sufficiently political about the fact that we need to think about uh, the damages that have been suffered by the statues as what has been lost, but also in terms of various things that have been gained. It would be all too easy for art historians, as it normally is, to label discoveries as being fake, um, which happens because fundamentally of a lethargy on our, in our profession. And because we don't actually challenge ourselves enough to try and explore why that object might be real. 
because it hasn't been received by us as being canonical and we haven't grown up seeing 19th century pictures of it. So I think it's much harder for us to accept the fact that they might be real. The object exists. Somebody has got to deal with it. Somebody has got to work with it in some way. And we have to find, as a profession, we have to find a way forward with dealing with these images that are going to come up, that are coming up. And uh, I think this is a part of a much larger political debate as to what's going to be the fate of these objects that have come out of the Northwest frontier in Afghanistan. Indeed, they are shrouded in suspicion that they might be fake. But imagine the other thing. Imagine if they are not fake. And imagine if they are real. And we have let them be sold on the market freely because we imagine that they are fake. And because they are fake, with impunity they can be traded. And we are not going to claim them and preserve them in our museums. And which art historian can stand up with impunity and confidence and say without a shadow of doubt that these are definitely fake? I'd be hard pressed to find one. And as long as we have a room for doubt in our minds, we owe these objects a responsibility of safekeeping. So that's as far as my, my views on the second part of the question are concerned. As far as the first part of the question is concerned, uh, I think this object was important and it is unique. I don't think it's common. I've been fortunate enough to, it's taken me several years to really unpack and analyze the iconological meanings behind this particular statue. But that's also because that's the kind of art history I like to do, I've discovered. And I'd like to look at the symbolism behind the images, um, rather than the kind of uh, spotting, necessarily. I like to look for the philosophical evolution of ideas in time. And that's what I've been trying to do with this image. Now, if one could do that with other images, uh, and one could try and do that with other images, I'm sure it would be possible. I think with cases of Shiva and Heracles, it would be possible to do it profitably. Having said that, this sculpture is unique, and this sculpture's placement is a clue. Where you have to ask the question of how would it have been used? And imagine it on the entrance to a stupa, uh, to a monastery, sorry, attracting pilgrims from all over the world who would have come to a site like Takhte Bahi. And they would have seen this at the entrance to the monastery, which is very much the kind of multicultural object that you, would be appropriate for the, the needs of a major monastery like Takhte Bahi, which is seen for kilometers, as, as Xuan Sang says, uh, where the golden domes are glittering for kilometers, as he records, um, as he approaches Takhte Bahi. I think uh, this kind of thing at the entrance to a monastery, because we know Harati sculptures and Kubera sculptures continue until the 7th, 8th centuries in India to be placed at the entrance to a monastery. And Colonel Walker clearly says that he found it in Yusufzai. He doesn't say that it was at Takhte Bahi. So, and Yusufzai has several monasteries. Um, so it could be from any of those places where it certainly has this multicultural appeal. I've been to a faker's workshop in, right. in SWAT. Uh, and they had long lines of every great book of Gandharanada, oh. plus all the latest on the recent Christie's catalogs. <laughs> it's a sophisticated operation, particularly in Stucco. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yes. Kurt. No. Well, I also really like your talk. Um, my question really sort of is about how we understand the same dynamic as it applies to Central Asia. I mean, I'm thinking specifically of the Shiva Oesho, um, Shiva's in Pantica. Um, but there must be, this must be much more sophisticated than that, I would think, going that direction. Um, the Panjikent paintings and all yeah. of that stuff, I mean, that you have in your museum and stuff. And well, those, I mean, I'm thinking of the Heracles. Yeah. Right. I mean, that stuff is spectacular. It is, of course, extremely sophisticated. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what the question is in this. I mean, what do I think about it? Well, Because I mean, belief, it is I mean, extraordinarily important. I think it's still, still at play there. Yeah, I mean, I think we could. We could look at that material um, as part of this. And I think we need to think about migrations and movements. I mean, today, we, that's what I said. That's why for Indian in inverted commas, that is the Hindu Indian something that is limited to the modern confines of India? Or how much did it actually spread? I mean, it's only since 47 
that the current maps have been drawn. Uh, so we know about the large number of Hindu shrines all through Afghanistan, and um, in, indeed spreading up into Central Asia, and the communities of the Hindus from the Northwest frontier famously traded with Russia um, all through, and with Syria. Um, it, there are records to that effect in, in St. Petersburg, which uh, detail the Hindu traders from the Northwest frontiers activities in Central Asia. And pilgrims coming from India to sites. To those, so I think... Even in the 19th century. So there is... Because I think it is interesting chronological dimension. I suppose that's one of the reasons I'm asking because you're really looking at this early horizon and yet, you know, certainly all of this carries on into... Up until... Into the 6th, 7th, 8th century. Indeed, it does. It does carry on to the 6th, 7th, 8th century. So, yeah. Jyotendra has a question that... Yeah. <coughs> Thanks, Nan, for raising so many questions with regard to various iconographic possibilities and connections. I want to ask you a question with regard to Shitala. You mentioned that uh, Shitala is a goddess who gives smallpox and then removes smallpox. Oh. Now, what would be the logic of giving smallpox and removing the smallpox? Why would such a person be a deity? So there has to be something more to it. Yes. Uh, uh, otherwise, why, why uh, uh, goddess? Now, entire Rajasthan, <coughs> major parts of southern Madhya Pradesh, and parts of Gujarat, there is a living ritual and widespread mythology about Shitala. And Shitala, as a goddess dreaded, is colonial. There is no pre-colonial reference to Shitala being a goddess dreaded by people who don't want. Right. On the other side, in this entire region, there is a lot of mythology and living ritual in which people invoke <coughs> Shitala to come and uh, 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 come into the body of a child, mm -hmm. meaning smallpox is invited. Is invited. Why? Absolutely. Yes. Got it. I mean, that you're absolutely right. Yeah. So smallpox is invited for the simple reason that if smallpox doesn't uh, inflict the child, the child does not become uh, does not become qualified to get married, and therefore in this region, Shitala is also adopting a role of goddess of marriage. Yes. Now, why marriage? Because if uh, a child is struck by a smallpox, might become blind, might die, and generally there was child marriage in this area, and therefore. The fathers and the family wanted uh, the goddess to come so that if the child survived, they becomes qualified to get married. So the uh, uh, girl's father would give a daughter only to a person in marriage who would be uh, who had had smallpox. Yeah. Absolutely, I know. <laughs> and you you've written this. Uh, you've talked about it yeah. to me before as yeah. well. And absolutely, so I, I understand that. Would be. Uh, Second small observation is that when you show the goddess with a bunch of graves and children around, but that is very close to the iconography of Ambika in Elora and elsewhere, where she's holding a bunch of mangoes in her uh, right hand mm. and she's surrounded by uh, children. Yeah, but um, I mean, we have no other depictions of Ambika before. Uh, uh, before the third, fourth centuries at the earliest would be stretched there. These things are a little bit earlier, but the presence of Jain imagery in Gandhara is another thing. I mean, if we are trying to say, you know, so it becomes difficult, but the presence of grapes in Gandhara rather than mangoes um, is something that is widespread and is associated with um, Greco-Roman imagery much more readily and for which there is a, a lot of evidence in, in the region. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, It was a wonderful, scintillating talk that you gave us. But there's something that I would like to understand about the Greek diaspora, especially about Gandhara, as to why all of a sudden you have this creation, the creativity, spurt of creativity there. We understand that the uh, Greek diaspora came in the wake of the Alexander's campaign and the dismantling of the Persian Empire 
And so I presume that the Greeks settled all over this area, which covers from the Mediterranean right up to the Himalayas. And yet it's only Gandhara, which stands out. Is there any explanation? Answer late. Answer late. late, yes. Yeah. Okay, so two related questions, and both have the same extended answer. Uh, I, you know, we, it's about a turn of phrase. Um, rather like Jyotendra was just saying that it's about a turn of phrase, how we say the same thing. Um, we can look upon it as a dread, but we can look upon it as a gift. And in the same way, in the wake of Alexander's campaign, many areas were secured that Greeks could later move to. The Greek settlements in the Northwest frontier don't happen either because of Alexander's campaign or uh, because there are already Greek settlements in the area which, is, which are recorded pre-Alexander. And then there are more than 20, there are 20 odd Alexandrias that he founds from Egypt all the way through to India. Uh, everywhere he camps out for a while, it's renamed and rechristened as, as uh, is renamed as Alexandria. And these Alexandrias become safe havens for a continuing diaspora, for continuing migrations which don't happen at one single moment in time at the time of Seleucus Nicator. But they are actually continuing migrations. So I think that's what needs to be understood because, of course, the material in Aikhanum is much earlier than a lot of the material in Sahib Belol or in later Takshila Stakos or wherever you're looking at. So indeed, there are, there are sites which have uh, Gandharanat is not a single moment in time and it's not a sudden efflorescence. I think it's looking, we're looking at a continuing patronage, which is at least 500 years long, because we're looking at Indo-Greek material, which is 2nd century BC, 1st century BC, then we're looking at, um, so even when we excavate in background, in one set of, one place, you have things of different dates, which are kept together. And so this idea of preserving and keeping, it means that archaeological strata are not so conveniently arranged for us that it only signals a certain moment in time. It might be the moment of burial, but what is being buried might be much older. And if we keep those kind of flexibilities in mind, and increasingly the kind of research that is coming out is trying to show us that a lot of what we associate with the Gandhara style that carries on to the fourth century AD we're looking at a, at least a 500 year span, if not an even longer span of production. So I hope that answers both your questions about how there are different movements and communities. And the, the community is not static, but it is one that it is a constantly evolving and hybridizing and changing community, um, which has multiple influences upon it at different times and different ethnicities, if that matters, or different religious groups that keep evolving in those regions. And that's very hard to grasp because we need to keep a very elastic way of thinking about that region because it's a, really a region that is constantly in flux. Yeah, but my question really was that there is an influence, a European influence, which has spread all right. I accept what you say. You cannot draw a line and say from here on what this happened and there was nothing happening before that. But where else is the similar kind of influence yeah. in the entire land mass that we see between the Mediterranean? Yeah. I think that's a good question. But I think we, in the Mediterranean, certainly, in Egypt, certainly, uh, but also um, if we look at uh, some of the material in Iran, uh, some of the sites that have come out, some of the Syrian material, which is very closely allied to the Indian material, um, I think a lot of the excavations in Dura Europos have uh, drawn a lot of attention even in the small finds at Dura. Uh, two similar small finds that are there in, in the Gandharan territories. So uh, there are parallels, but certainly the volume of Gandharan material <coughs> is larger than the rest, except the Ptolemaic material, which is equally huge. So Buddhism didn't have too much to do with the entire thing that happened over there. Pardon? Buddhism 
per se did not have that much of an influence in, in this creative aspect that went on during that period? No, it has an enormous impact. <laughs> it has a major impact. I think Buddhism is a very contributory force and is the, is the fundamental religion that is being followed. It is the, certainly the most dominant one. But it's not at the exclusion of many others. It's certainly the most dominant religious persuasion. But that's a different question. Yes. Um, so picking up on the notion of dynamics, looking at your example of Ariti, I think what, the extraordinary thing in that sculpture also is that it captures, it's a, a stone sculpture chiseled in stone, but it actually captures a whole narrative of something that moves, a whole iconography that has evolved over a long period of time and isn't static. Um, so I'm fascinated by the idea of we're trying to identify something, we're trying to interpret something, but maybe the key is the ambiguity, the fluidity of it all, encompassing uh, the possibility of movement and appealing it. It can be whatever you want to see in it, whatever you'd like to worship it as. It can be that. For the different communities. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah um, I just have that. I didn't have a question actually, I just had a comment that I really uh, appreciated, your uh, application of contemporary uh, diaspora theory to develop this idea of a kind of conscious polyvalence. And of course we also see that epigraphically in the Rabatak inscription, where you have these interlin brilliant interlinear glosses, right, which could be read um, in similar ways as the uh, iconography of the Arita sculpture in the Right. 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 Right.